there was one young guy. It was just so striking to me, the thing that he said, where he was like, you know, I use TikTok. I like TikTok, but I, I, you know, I really don't think I'd have too much of a problem if it got banned um, because I really have kind of noticed it's deleterious effects on my mental health. It's hurt my attention span. You know, it's made it harder for me to focus and things. So I really don't, I, I think it'd be okay with me if it got banned. And I was just, delete it from your phone. You know, like <laughs> you, just get it out of there. You don't have to be on there. You know, just like go on Facebook or YouTube or read a book, you know, please. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're talking about TikTok. Now, it's hard to get Joe Biden and Lauren Boebert on the same page about anything, but that's exactly what happened in recent weeks when a bill passed the U.S. House that could end up banning TikTok unless its Chinese parent company, ByteDance, sells it. Even if the bill passes the Senate and President Biden signs it, as he has said that he would, it is likely headed for a legal battle. So TikTok still going to be part of our lives in the short term. But I was curious about the impact TikTok has on voters' political news diets, especially young voters. And what we heard from them in our focus groups was not great. My guest today is Bulwark White House correspondent and co-author of our Morning Shots newsletter, Andrew Egger. What's up, man? Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. Are you, like me, a bit of a TikTok skeptic? I uh, I consume all of my TikTok content like a good uh, millennial via reposts to Instagram Reels. I have mm. never uh, I've never had the the app on my phone, and yes, I think uh, especially as I have been covering this. Uh, uh, this bill, as it's worked its way through, and some of the national security concerns, I have become more and more of a of a TikTok skeptic myself, personally. Yeah, so I am not on Instagram. I mean, technically, I guess I have an Instagram account. Like at some point, someone set one up for me, but I don't use it. Uh, and so, and I definitely don't have TikTok. Like you and I are. Uh, you don't have to tell me your age, but I bet we're at least a decade apart. Um, and so, you know, I live with. Twitter and like the very occasional Facebook. Uh, and I just can't learn any new apps. Like I didn't even learn threads when it got really hot, despite JBL's, uh, you know, insistence that I do. I just can't. So I don't have any of the, I, I like I, the TikTok thing has been hard for me, I think, to follow from a policy standpoint because I don't care about it or experience it. And so I have worried, I worried that my opinion on TikTok was too colored by a like, you kids get off my lawn, uh, elder, I'm not even an elder millennial, I'm a zennial. I was born in 1980. And so, you know, right between sort of the Gen Xers and the millennials. You're like a firm millennial, right? That's right. Sweet spot millennial. It's safe to say. Sweet spot millennial. Okay. So why don't you level set for us? What is the debate happening right now? You're like our not you're our White House correspondent, you're our morning shots newsletter, you're our, a political guy. So just like tell us what's happening now and uh what would have to happen for TikTok to be banned in the United States. Um or at least not be Chinese spyware. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk it it was fascinating listening to some of these focus groups because it turns out there are two completely different debates happening about the about the bill. But let's talk about the one uh, the way that policymakers are talking about it first, which is that you had this bill it com- came out of the the bipartisan House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party, um, and and it came out with a lot of kind of bipartisan agreement about some specific national security concerns around this app. And the problem is that it's owned by this Chinese company, ByteDance, um, and that Chinese companies, uh, Chinese tech companies in particular, but but just Chinese companies in general operating out of China are forced to kind of maintain very close ties with the Chinese Communist Party. Um, And and there are basically two main uh, issues that the, the committee alleges um, and puts forward are, are basically problems with them specifically having ownership of a social media app that 150 odd million Americans use. And the first is um, data privacy concerns. Um, obviously, it's been, you know, <laughs> uh, we've had data privacy concerns about the apps we've been using uh, for decades, whether they're owned by uh, foreign companies or American companies. Um, 
doesn't seem like there's this enormous uh, kind of public pushback on any of this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of data that gets vacuumed up. That said, uh, TikTok in particular, just in its in its terms of service, is extra, extra invasive in the amount of data it collects, even data outside of its own app. Um, so that's led some, some national security uh, analysts to essentially consider it spyware. I mean, that, that TikTok, in theory, could be collecting, um, you know, stuff you punch into your banking app uh, and then sending that off to, to a company that... Um, you know, has the uh, the Chinese Communist Party has its fingerprints all over. Nobody's saying that they have actually done that, but but there's nothing really stopping them according to their own terms of service. Um, and and uh, that's one one problem. The other problem uh, is about uh, just kind of the the algorithmic delivery of content to people who use TikTok. I mean, it's TikTok's one of these kind of like infinite scrolling apps, right? Where where you really are just kind of hooking your brain up to. Uh, you know, a pipeline that that there's a handshake agreement between you and the app. The app's like, here's the pipeline that we've made just for you that we think you'll really like. And apparently they're very good at that because people really like their TikTok and they'll scroll it for hours. But that kind of content delivery is is extra susceptible to kind of letting these these uh, these algorithms that are not visible to the consumer really shape the content you see, the things that you see on a given issue. So for political content in particular, uh, there's this danger that, well, you know, on, on issues where, where, uh, Chinese uh, geopolitical interests are involved, uh, they, th that government has shown uh, a really alarming willingness to throw its weight around, uh, even for American companies and certainly on TikTok, uh, the, you know, the, the app has been shown to kind of suppress certain, certain political elements that are uh, not conducive, not, not, uh, they don't play well with, with Chinese interests. And so at, at a time of rising kind of geopolitical tension between the United States and China, uh, there's this fear that, that, you know, we perhaps should not be uh, super happy about letting hundreds of millions of Americans uh, shape their political views about that conflict on this app owned by this Chinese company with these ties to this party. So those are kind of the two main things uh, that, that, that policymakers are talking about. And what the bill would do, I know I'm talking a long time here, what That's the bill good. would do yeah. uh, is, is essentially uh, present this company ByteDance with a choice. It would say, you need to divest uh, from this company, or you need to divest this company within 165 days. If not, uh, it would not actually be banned within the United States, but it would be forced to be delisted from app stores. So people would not be able then to download it. I mean, you could not actually kind of reach into everybody's phone and make them delete it. Um, but it would essentially be the long term kiss of death for the app in the United States. Um, so the hope policymakers hope would be that that would compel ByteDance uh, to offload the thing to sell it to an American company. Um, there's some tactical reasons why that might be tricky. I mean, it's a very valuable app. The, there's perhaps antitrust concerns. So it's it's maybe a little less cut and dry than the proponents uh, would would want it to be. But that's the idea is, is hopefully uh, they force this sale. Everybody still gets their TikToks. We've just dealt with this national security concern on the back end. Yeah. Okay. That's a great level set. So for this show, we talked to three separate groups. We talked to Trump to Biden voters, uh, commonly known on this show as flippers, uh, who have school-aged kids who use TikTok. So these were grown-ups. Uh, but then we also talked to Gen Z conservatives who use TikTok and Gen Z progressives who use TikTok. And we found that there was a real disconnect between the urgency and consensus around this issue in Congress and how it's trickling down to voters who use the app. Uh, put a different way, people love them some TikTok. Uh, and I, again, as a non-user of TikTok, basically whether it's Chinese spy or not, like the level of devotion people have to this, the extent to which it is shaping how they think, and more importantly, the extent to which they feel like truth is being delivered via TikTok, uh, uh, it gave me the heebie-jeebies, um, this whole, the whole way down. So I'm going to start with um, the Trump to Biden parents. So let's listen to how they talk about it. They assume that the owner of TikTok was Chinese. I saw something on the news where they asked him over and over, if he was affiliated to China, it just it just seems like they're trying to distract people from other things. I mean, you know, yep. <laughs> they pushed this bill and they passed it so quickly, but they couldn't pass a bill quickly to lower the cost of everything here in their country. 
So it just doesn't make any sense, you know, where they put their efforts in. I feel like it being, you know, created in China and, and it being weaponized is essentially what they're trying to push the agenda of. I personally think it's not in our government's right or, you know, any to tell us what we can and can't consume. I think the whole thing is very hypocritical. I hear that they're saying blah, 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 security this and security that. Very hypocritical, seeing as how no one cared about the spy balloon that was flying over the country. And there's plenty of other things that are violating our security and everything like that. No one cares about that. Why are they attacking TikTok? You know, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I know I sound like a conspiracy theorist by saying all those things, but that's kind of where I'm at. Mainly the hypocrisy around all of it. Okay, so... And here's, I will just say as a broader context, we've done a lot of focus group, uh, focus groups just over the course of time I've done them about social media, especially we've talked to a lot of parents uh, with kids who use social media. And I would just say overall, this group struck me as pretty similar to what we've seen, which is, and I think this is the way I would put it, which is uh, kids who use social media have parents who use social media. And so the idea that parents... Like, I know a lot of parents who are exercised about how we're going to deal with kids and their phones. But that might be, we might be in the minority about that because I listen to a lot of parents talk about it. And like, they don't like if their kids are on it too much or whatever, but like, they're not, like, they're on TikTok. Their kids are on TikTok. They're kind of like, oh, well. And this idea, these young, the young people and everybody seems to not be that worried about data collection. And I guess, do you think, all of the talk about election interference by Russia in 2016, related to Trump's first impeachment in 2019, and now Trump's accusations that it's criminal cases or election interference. Is that all just like desensitized people to the threats from foreign governments? Like no one seems to care. Is, is it like, why do you think that is? Why are we all just fine with this? Yeah, so there's a couple things. One, I think that's absolutely Correct. But I also think there are a lot of other things that have have desensitized uh, people to some of this stuff. Um, just kind of the, the the broader data collection issues for American companies that, you know, dating back decades, some, some of the fights that were had about, you know, how much Facebook is scraping off of your phone or, or, or things like that. You know, the, the, the sale of that data to, to third party categories, the fact that the kind of whole the whole modern Internet is kind of based on on those sorts of transactions. Um, I mean, I think it makes it hard to, to make these kind of sales. I, I was really struck listening to specifically the parents on the focus group, um, they really did not seem to break TikTok out from any of those kind of like larger, those kids and their phones kind of concerns. I mean, it was all kind of one parcel uh, of, okay, you know, our, our kids are on their phones too much. Um, but, you know, they, they weren't thinking about that really in like political terms. They were thinking about it more in like, oh, you know, they don't really go outside and play with their friends kind of concerns. And when they had this, and I, I, I was struck also by how many of the parents said they themselves had, had you know, downloaded TikTok uh, in particular, because they saw that as kind of like a, a bonding thing with their kids. So so there, it was almost like this, um, like, a, 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 I don't think you guys asked it this way in particular, but it almost seemed like they saw TikTok as as one of the less, uh, uh, you know, poor uses of time the kids could be doing on those devices because, you know, well, you know, maybe they're not having a childhood like I had where they're getting outside and and maybe they're spending too much time on their phones. Maybe it's hurting their attention span. But at the same time, this is something that he and I can kind of do together. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I, I don't think, I mean, a, a couple of times, some of the, the stuff uh, that we were talking about with uh, the specific concerns about China uh, came up in that parents focus group. Um, but, but overwhelmingly my, my read of it was that they, they just, they, they, they basically just see this action as uh, Congress is trying to ban one of the apps my kids use for some reason. Just to underscore this point, because you're a hundred percent correct that that's what I heard too. Is uh, is I want to play the sound actually, just where it is like, yeah, this is just another social media thing, and I have broad concerns about how social media is impacting my kids, but not specifically TikTok. Let's listen. I can definitely see that. Like when I take the phone from her, she definitely cops like a crazy attitude, and she's upset for like a little period of time before she forgets about the phone. So I've actually been minimizing her phone usage completely. It seems like they no longer want to go out and they re prefer to play with people online and not really f interact physically. The way that the algorithm works in order to, to get you to consume the content, it really 
on the psychological side, it really trains your mind to not be able to accept any, any information past a certain amount of time. Like if you've noticed all these videos are two, three minutes long at max, how many times after that do you kids enjoy watching like a, a TV show or a movie where it's content, it's an hour long? I feel like it's ruining the attention spans of kids. I feel like having the accessibility to it all the time on your phones, that's a problem as well. My niece ended up saying something based off of a TikTok that was just very out of character, something she didn't even understand to my son. And it really upset him because he understood he's older. Just sometimes you cannot parental control the content. And so you get those times where they say something they don't even know what it means. My 12-year-old son will be playing video games with an iPad open next to him and his phone on his lap. That's my son too. <laughs> Mine yeah, too. Like, you know, to be able to focus just on one thing is hard. To focus on all of those is even harder. But then if they don't have all of that, it's the inability to focus. It's the inability to pay attention because they need that overstimulation. And if they don't have it, then you hear things like, well, I'm bored. I'm like, okay, go. Oh, my God. I hate go that outside word. and play. Go do something. <laughs> go read a book. Go do some homework. I don't want to hear that you're bored. I just... You and I both have youngish kids, and I can just, like, see this coming for me, like, barreling down. I'm like, they can't have a phone until they're 16. Like, I don't even care about TikTok. It is this idea about how fast everything moves and how, I mean, somebody in the group talked about their five-year-old having a phone. Uh, and, like, I just, oh, oh, the phones, the phones and the social media. But that's not, the thing is, is, like, that's not the issue here. Uh, like, it's true. We have this, like, broader cultural problem of how we're going to deal with social media in our lives, what it's doing to our brains, what it's doing to our attention spans. Um, all that is true. TikTok, though, the point of the problem with TikTok isn't that it's like a fast delivery mechanism for content, uh, though it is that. The problem with TikTok is that it's owned by the Chinese government. But I was surprised, um, especially among the parents, just how unbothered they were, that China could have access to this. Like, why do you think, because it is, I, I don't think it's not, I hear from especially Republicans all the time about what a threat China is. Like, people seem aware of China as a threat, but no one here seemed to care about China having access to their information, at least not enough that it, like, in any way would curb the use of how they, like, engaged with TikTok. Yeah, I, I I wondered about this, and I I wonder whether there is um a a sense in which the the kind of algorithmic specified personalized delivery that we were talking about before um kind of plays to TikTok's benefit in the sense that if you're a parent with young kids um and you see that they're using TikTok and just like you know getting video game content on there or recipes or silly drama between like these tween personalities, you know, I mean like. The, the YouTuber thing. Um, and then you hear about this, this debate that's about, you know, the way that political content is fed on this app. You might just be, be kind of like, well, come on. I mean, like, I, I'm on TikTok. My kids are on TikTok. We don't see political content on TikTok. That's not really like, that's not what the system's delivering up to us. So it feels a lot more abstract. Um, whereas, you know, it, it tends to be older kids, young, young adults, I mean, people who have started to care about these things, when you start to care about these things, the algorithm notices that when it feeds you something like that, you actually pay attention, it starts to give you more and more of that content. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, when we talk about the the, the Gen Z or uh, uh, groups, because they were getting political content on TikTok, but I can definitely see um, where if I'm a parent, uh, who's like struggling to make my eight year old or, or what have you uh, spend less time on her phone, more time on her homework, more time reading, more time outside. Uh, I I can see, well, the political, con like the political nature of this stuff uh, is maybe the least of my worries or the data collection uh, is the least of my worries. Like my kid does not have a banking app on her phone, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I can see how th for that particular demographic, it doesn't come in nearly as much as it might for others. And I'll just, I'll offer this too, that when I've done a lot of the focus groups about parents and social media, their number one concern uh, for boys tends to be porn. And their number one concern for girls tends to be like creeps on the internet mm -hmm. um, and like people reaching out to them. And I don't know enough about TikTok, but it seems like neither of those things are a big problem on that platform the way they were on like 
Snapchat. I don't even know, but like the 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 people, the getting the parents that talked about how and and it was like self esteem too for young girls. It was like creeps and also like what it was doing to their their feeling about who they were, and they were much more concerned about Instagram um, in that regard. And so I don't know if it's something about TikTok where it, it it has this personalized delivery, but it it doesn't have some of those other negatives that are like the chief concerns of parents. You'd have to tell me. Uh, but is that possible? Well, so so one thing I'd say about that is that while while some of this stuff is not, um, it's certainly not the the key focus of this fight because this is such a national security fight. There is a whole other group of people who don't like TikTok, you know, kind of on the merits. Um, it's not it's not porn so much. My understanding is they have pretty stringent um, controls around, um, you know, like specifically adult content or even like you know much swearing and, and things like that. Um, but, but, uh, it's supposedly, and again, I don't have TikTok, but you know, reportedly it's very easy to surface, um, different kinds of concerning content, like eating disorder content is apparently, mm. uh, very, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to kind of stumble into, uh, these, these sort of rabbit holes or, or, you know, like, uh, insanely radicalizing like political content in one way, like kind of the red pill sort of thing. Um, you know, yeah. th- those sorts of like, like kind of weird niche, internet hardcore subcultures uh, that that for a lot of parents, they kind of imagine these as existing in some like dark, uh, you know, dusty corner of 4chan or Reddit or something like that. Um, it actually is pretty easy just to kind of like stumble into that stuff just by like kind of following a little breadcrumb tr- crumb trail of video. So that, that that is a concern for a lot of mm-hmm. people. It's just not really the fight that we're having with this specific bill because of the nature of the, the kind of national security focused uh, group that put the bill together. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that's, see, that's bad. Now I'm, uh, okay. Uh, all right. I want to talk, <laughs> get into how the, the Utes, the, the Utes talked about this stuff. Because uh, I found the way the kids talked about TikTok uh, to be just like super eerie. Um, all right. Let's listen to the Gen Z progressives first. There's a certain congressman named Jeff Jackson of yes. North Carolina. He literally like gained his following. I didn't know about him until I saw his and like I liked him. I was like, wow, like he's being so transparent. Like he's telling us what's happening in the rooms that we can't see. And then he voted to ban it. And I'm not suggesting a conspiracy or anything, but it did stop to make me think, be like, what do they know that we don't? Like, why would he do that? I'm not really concerned about like China taking our data or like the US even is like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with global entry. It's like like a higher level TSA. You literally walk through the security. I don't even go up to a kiosk. They take somehow take a picture of my face. I go up to the counter and they say, hey, yeah, you're good. They have all my information. Like, I think there's no stopping it at this point. Obviously we do have more pressing issues that the government should be addressing. But at the same time, if TikTok were to get banned, I just feel like another app exactly like TikTok would pop up. It's not the fact that they're banning it. It's why they're banning it. And it's mainly because, again, they can't control the narrative. They can't control the algorithm and what goes on there. And one thing I've noticed is that most of the politicians that voted yes on this ban are on TikTok. And a lot of times they'll be talking down to their audience being like, well, we've seen documents and stuff that you guys haven't seen. And it's like, I don't believe that. I think that this has to do with the fact that a lot of the support for Palestine is coming from that app. And they don't like the fact that a lot of people are now more knowledgeable politics wise because of TikTok. Okay. You know, the thing that I hear that freaks me out the most, I think, and this is the Everything in the focus groups, one of the things I'm trying to figure out always, is like, who do people trust, right? Where do they, where do they, what do they say like, oh, this is, this is good information. And what's weird about the TikTok stuff is that they are untrustworthy of the, Amer- they think the American government is stealing their information. They think the American government is trying to control what information they have And it's TikTok that is giving them the real information, the truth. And this is a psychological thing I've noticed, you know, like Tucker Carlson, one of the things, one of the ways that he really relates to his audience is by being like, those guys over there, they're lying to you. They're lying to you. I'm the only one who will tell you the truth. And there's a a connection that you can build with an audience that way 
of making them feel like you, Elon does that, right? Like nowhere else can you get free speech. This is this, you trust, you forget media. You can't trust the media. You can trust what you see on this platform, which of course is just like, you know, dope idiot 229 can just, you know, say whatever nonsense uh, and Elon will retweet it. And so like this idea of they trust TikTok more than the American government, uh, which I mean, I'm not a big believer in loving and trusting the government myself, but like I, I this idea that TikTok is the one and true arbiter of where they can go to get free and unfettered uh, information, that feels pretty not great. Yeah. So, so two things I'd say about that. And the first is just as kind of like a long time sort of prickly libertarian guy on some of this data stuff. Uh, like I, I, I want to like grab like the federal government and or Facebook and Google like by the lapels and shake them and be like, you did this, you know, yeah. like you, <laughs> you, you, you're the reason what you, they, they, they're correct. The kids are correct that you're already vacuuming up all their data. And you can say till you're blue in the face that you're going to be a more responsible steward of it than the app they like, but you're not the app they like. The app they like is the app they like. And if you're both vacuuming up their data, like of course they're going to, so, so I think some of this is chickens coming home to roost and, mm-hmm. and problems that are decades old that should have been addressed. And now we're kind of p- paying the consequences of that. Um, but on the, on the question of the, the trust thing, I think it's really interesting. And I think that, that there's, there is a, a way in which TikTok, um, it really does kind of, uh, nurture in, it, it, it's attractive to people who, who, uh, find kind of other uh, kind of institutionalized information networks um, to be kind of suspect on uh, just because they're institutionalized. I mean, it's it's it, if if you look at like a a broadcast TV network where you have your uh, your your broadcaster, he's there in a suit and tie, he's got all the graphics behind him. It's all very slickly presented. I mean, all of that is there to convey a certain kind of trustworthiness, but. If you're the kind of person who who is like, oh, there's somebody like behind the scenes kind of pulling the strings, telling that guy what he can and can't say, then all of that works exactly the opposite direction. And, may, and maybe you look at TikTok and it's not that guy at all. It's some dude on his couch in a hoodie with his little iPhone mic held up to his held up to his mouth while, you know, in front of like a green screen, just kind of talking about the news. And you're saying that's unfiltered. That's unvarnished. Um, that's the real dope. Nobody's telling this guy uh, what to say. He's just telling it how he sees it. And I'm judging that based on, you know, what, what, what I think. And, and that's how it's supposed to work. And, and what goes completely unremarked upon because it's invisible is the delivery system that put that particular guy on your particular screen. Um, it's, it's not at all unfiltered. I mean, you did not, you did not search that guy out by name. You might've searched the topic, but, but there's a, the, the filtration system is completely opaque and behind the scenes. Um, so that's the, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's, it's, I mean, my eyes were kind of bugging out listening to some of these people, too, when they would use words like unfiltered to talk about kind of the the news they'd get through TikTok. And even though they look at the rest of the news media with a critical eye, right, they are not very uncritical about the actual PR campaign that TikTok has been running in the United States, right? So TikTok knows, I mean, obviously TikTok knows that the, the, this legislation is happening. They're fighting it actively and they're fighting it through their users. Uh, and so I have been engaging with this only by sort of th- through the media conversation. And so I know what TikTok is putting out to their users. And what's weird is how the TikTok users just repeat it right back to you. Like the information that TikTok is giving them about why they need to keep TikTok is the exact reasons we heard from the young progressives. It's just like straight up propaganda. Let's listen. And I saw an article that said that I think TikTok generated like $2.5 billion for the U.S. economy. So it's like if they do take that app away, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. Last year, after the first hearing to get the politicians off his back, I do remember the CEO made it so that all of the U.S. data is stored on American soil. So like all of the servers that hold our information is like in some database in Texas. So like our information isn't even held with everyone else's around the world. So they can't even say that it's the data. No, it's starting to get political because, you know, that's how our generation is. And this is our main source of entertainment, passing free time. It's just crazy because this ban not will only affect us politically like getting our news out there it's going to affect so many small businesses 
and um, all the other things like that as well. There are so many people that rely on TikTok for like engagement with their business or whatever the, the case. With that ban, I'm like, there would be a mass response. I only got the chance to listen to some of the earlier hearings where um, it just sounded like politicians were kind of just like grasping for straws at why TikTok should be banned, touching on like, oh, do you have any association with the Chinese government? No, I'm Singaporean. And it's like, mm, what's the point here? What are we really trying to get at? Because I think the fact that we can't trust politicians is because they're just throwing these things out and it does feel like a distraction. They're trying to distract us. Uh, okay. Uh, so I I don't know if you know the answer to this, but like that propaganda campaign from TikTok has been going on for a long time now. Um, and do, like, do you think they knew they, they they've been, it seemed like they've been priming people for a long time? Like, I listening to voters all the time, I am shocked by the amount of information people knew about TikTok, and it's all the information that TikTok has provided them. Like, uh, you hear this over and over from people. Well, it's taking people's jobs away. Um, I mean, that person was able to say the amount of money that it's generated for the United States economy. Do you know what a young person could tell you about any other industry in the United States and what they generate for the U S economy? Zero. I listened to a lot of them. I couldn't, you know, uh, so is this, uh, yeah, like, and what do you think the political implications would be if Joe Biden did sign this? Like if the bill went through, uh, and Joe Biden was forced to sign it. Cause I gotta tell you, if I were him, I'd be nervous about signing it with how rabid and informed and uh, hijacked these voters are on this. Well, and that's what makes it such a such a weird kind of fiddly political issue, because nobody knows what will happen if he signs the bill, because it's up to ByteDance, right? It could very well be that ByteDance will agree to sell. And um, some American company does put together an offer and the handoff is seamless and it works. Uh, and then everybody wins because the kids still get their TikTok. Uh, and Joe and a lot of these people get to run on this bipartisan thing they did to shore up your data security. Uh, or it could blow up there could be no more TikTok all of a sudden, and a lot of people could get really mad about that. Um, and it would cause, a little, like, like you say, or like that kid said, <laughs> a little, like, not, I don't want to say a little bit. It would cause some economic pain because the, a bazillion people use this app. Uh, and it's true. I mean, like, people uh, have launched their small businesses on there and things like that. And so and because nobody knows uh, which of the two it is, it has caused, you know, some weird coalitions because people are making different kind of judgment calls as to, as to what's likely. I will say on, on the specific thing of the PR campaign, um, the reason there has been so much time to, to, for them to spin this up, even though this bill only just kind of has been talked about in the last few weeks is because Donald Trump tried to do this unilaterally, uh, like five years ago. And he had, he had initially tried to do basically this exact thing, forced by dance to divest via executive order. Uh, and it didn't really go anywhere. It got kind of held up in the courts. Um, but, but I think that TikTok really saw as like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. There's this, there's this coalition over there that doesn't want us there. And they kind of put a full court press out. So, I mean, you can watch, uh, you know, I, I, I see ads on TV all the time about, you know, how good TikTok is for this or that content creator who's kind of reorganize their lives around it and feel good stories and things like that. Um, and, and so it's tricky to say because there, it, there would be some pain if it were to actually cease to exist in America. It's just not clear whether that is what would happen if the bill passed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was just having a thought. You, it's going back to something you said before about being a cranky libertarian about this stuff. And me too. I too am a cranky libertarian about this stuff. And so I generally am like, don't ban things. Don't, don't, you know, people can make their own decisions, but it bumps up against a different part of my libertarianist, which is that, like, I want you to be able to think freely and thinking freely, the, but, but, you know, that, that we get all kinds of inputs, right? And people can choose what those inputs are. You can read books, you can read newspapers, you can read the news, you can read poetry, you can, uh, you know, where you get your information, like no one can control that, but there is something that's like, 1984-ish of the hijacking of the brain that also hits my libertarian sensibilities. And like, you think this is free thought, but it's not free thought. Someone is controlling this. But some of the points that people make back to me of, well, that was, you know, Facebook started, you know, they were influencing how you think. God knows Twitter influences how we think. Um, so it's a, it really is a tough issue. For me, the, the Chinese spyware thing, though, is like pretty clean cut. 
um, anyway, can I, can I say yeah, one, one thing on, yeah, that, yeah. on that point? And I don't remember whether it was in the, the young Trump voters or the young Biden voters focus group, but there was one young guy who, the, 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 it was just so striking to me, the thing that he said, where he was like, you know, I use TikTok. I like TikTok, but I, I, you know, I really don't think I'd have too much of a problem if it got banned um, because I really have kind of noticed it's deleterious effects on my mental health. It's hurt my attention span. You know, it's made it harder for me to focus and things. So I really don't, I, I think it'd be okay with me if it got banned. And I was just, delete it from your phone. You know, like <laughs> you just get it out of there. You don't have to be on there, you know, just like go on Facebook or YouTube or read a book, you know, please like you use, I, 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 it was really, I just, I, I don't even know what political point to make about that, but, but it was very strange. Like, uh, like you have the power to, 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 to fix this in your own life, man. I don't know, but it goes to the kind of the compulsion and the, the hijacking of, of the kind of pleasure centers in your brain that you were, you were alluding to. Yeah. But uh, it's also like, you know, I know the war on drugs didn't work and the war on social media is not going to work either. Uh, but like, there's got to be some kind of equilibrium that we can find culture. Whatever. Now I'm just now I'm just musing because I'm fearful about how this because the thing is and I'm going to get to the conservatives right now. There is a lot and maybe I'll let me ask it this way. This is a provocative way to think about this. Do you think that the Chinese government wants Donald Trump to be our president? I genuinely do not know the answer to that. I, I, and I think they were probably as surprised as anybody when, when he came out against this bill because he had supported it in the past, um, which had to do more with domestic politics, seemingly, which we could talk about. I don't know if we, we care. We do. I've got, I've got, I've got okay, some at great. the back. Um, but yeah, I, I genuinely, I genuinely don't know. They, they've been roughly the same. Uh, Biden has kind of carried on a lot of Trump's uh, kind of economically aggressive trade policies toward China. Um, I don't know whether I, I, I have a hard time parsing out the differences in how they are on Taiwan and things like that. So I, I, I genuinely don't know the, I, the answer to, to, to how Xi Jinping is likely to, to feel about the, the election. I, ju I just know that as a matter of like freaking out, the Democrats are very freaked out by how much pro-Trump content there is on the site. And even pro-Trump is like not even quite that. It's all the, the like – barstool sports and even like men's rights advocates that are all over there um, that that I think ultimately sort of benefit Trump as a movement or as a way of thinking. Um, but but let's talk about the the conservative kids. Do go ahead. Did you want to say something on that? Yeah, I just had one more thought really quickly on the on that point. I, I think there is kind of an an asymmetry there because the we talked about how it's it's the kind of anti-institutional iconoclastic content that thrives on there. Yeah. And there's an asymmetry because the iconoclastic right wing content favors Trump. But the iconoclastic left wing content, a lot of it is anti-Biden because a lot of it is about Israel and Palestine. It's um, such a good and, point. And Biden has has you know, been, been pretty staunchly, uh, pro Israel, or, you know, you could argue a little bit, a lot more staunchly pro pro Israel than a lot of his young progressive base. And so, uh, I do think that there is, um, you know, uh, young right-wing people are probably getting stuff that makes them like Trump more and young left-wing people are getting stuff that makes them like Biden less. That is such an essential point, an essential point, because I, I, I don't want to go to, we did ask the young progressives about politics, um, I didn't really include it cause I, but like, here's the fact, the fact was they'd all voted for Biden before and a bunch of them didn't want to vote for him again. Uh, right. Like they were, the young progressives were mad at Biden. It was mostly over Gaza. Um, and they saw TikTok as where they could get their real Gaza information, the young progressives. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I do think there's an asymmetric problem. And I think you just nailed, uh, the dichotomy of it. Okay. So let's talk about the young conservatives. Cause here's the thing. I would have expected, and so one might expect, that Republican kids these days would be China hawks because Trump, Trump talks about China, you know, being so bad all the time, the China virus on, you know, whatever. But that's not what happened. Let's listen. A lot of the content that I also see on TikTok that isn't directly about politics is calling out the government for what they put in our foods, the prescriptions that we're given from pharmaceuticals, things about the vaccine, things about money that we're giving to other countries, things that the government doesn't really want us to know and doesn't really want us to see. And it's very heightened. And I mean, personally, ever since I've seen these things on TikTok, I, I've changed my lifestyle with what I eat, the food that I buy, I read all the labels. I cannot believe what the government allows us to eat. And I just, I don't think that they like that. I think that they don't want us to have that raw information. 
I think it's interesting that the government wants to suppress something that they can't control. Or I'm sorry, I don't think it's surprising that they want to suppress something they can't control. I was only interested about it when I heard that the U.S. wanted to ban it because I'm like, well, this is interesting. We're in a time right now where cancel culture is like a really big thing. The whole TikTok trying to get banned is so silly. I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of the senators and congressmen and women having stock in other things like Facebook. And since TikTok isn't a publicly traded company, it's their biggest competitor. It's a huge competitor. Uh, They don't like that. ByteDance were to divest TikTok to another American company. It's not any different than Facebook. Facebook is also a private sector company that controls the media, as is Fox News, as is every single media source that we gain all of our you know, information from. So I think the ban is silly just because it's just not going to change. The reality is this company is owned by the Chinese government. I don't think it's crazy that politicians are concerned about the content. You know, I think security might be a little bit of a joke, but the content, I think that's very real. I mean, just look at, you mentioned the gender stuff earlier, right? How did the gender stuff become such a big topic here in America? Social media and school. Like, you control both of those things. You control all the minds of America. So there's one guy who seemed to be concerned about the Chinese government thing. But I mean, across these three groups, it was just that was not the thing. Um, And I don't know. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't I don't know what to I don't know what to say about the conservative kids other than they were not China hawks. They were everybody hates the American government. And it's funny because. As a young libertarianish person, I too was very skeptical of our government, but I don't know that my instinct would have been like to trust like China's government more. <laughs> like I think the problem here is it is one thing to be skeptical of our government's another thing to be like and so I trust the Chinese Communist Party to give me the straight dope on America. Yeah, yeah. And I I I don't know that I necessarily read them that they I mean, the different the different uh, uh, focus group respondents varied, but n- not necessarily that they were like U.S. good, China bad. It's it was more just just kind of the sense that like the kind of the cat was already out of the bag with, yeah. with the data collection stuff and with the uh, you know everybody's going to be giving you some kind of spin. There's some kind of angle anywhere you look. Um, this is a little more unvarnished than than like turning on the nightly news. Um, and so maybe it's, you know, maybe the, the, the truth kind of slips through even despite the slant. But but yeah, I mean, just just very, very little distinguishing from really anybody with but, but between, OK, U.S. actors have my data uh, and Chinese actors might also have my data and U.S. actors might be trying to sell me a big a bit a bill of goods and Chinese actors might be trying to sell me a bill of goods. And, and I don't, I don't know of maybe that one guy right at the end would have, would have said that the, the latter was worse than the former, but for the most part, I mean, they were just like, our data's out there, whatever. Uh, people are trying to spin us, whatever. Uh, we basically think this bill's a big waste of time. It was very interesting to see. I mean, just, just very little kind of foreign policy geopolitics thought at all. Yeah. And I, I guess the thing is, I know this to be true as a, as an essential truth. Now, when we, when we, develop our content for Republican voters against Trump. Like when I want to do persuasion content, I don't use, you know, people, people are always like, well, get a celebrity or whatever. I'm like, no, you know who people trust? People like them. Like it is, and they want it to look authentic and they want it to look like the person isn't trying to, isn't trying to spin them, isn't trying to gain them. And so real people like them from their tribe, like that is who they trust now. And there's part of me that's like, well, this is sort of how content democratizes, right? It like makes sense that people don't want some, they don't want the government or they don't want a company or they don't want some big institutions deciding things for them. Uh, and so what they want is, is to, is to get information from people like them. The downside of that is the absolute uh, hollowing out of expertise of people who actually know what they're talking about when they're talking about these things. Um, uh, th- you know, there was this meme or this thing I saw one time that I always, always s- stuck with me that said, uh, the internet did to our parents what they said video games were going to do to us. 
uh, and that always struck me as like kind of true, right? Like we always think about sort of like the boomers who are not native to the internet suddenly be, you know, going down rabbit holes and telling you how they have to do their own research on X, Y, or Z. You know, we're all dealing with our parents saying weird things they read on the internet. But I don't, I, that, that I think is too generous to us and to the generations that are native, because I think at the end of the day, there's always someone in control of the information people are getting. And one of the other things that has jumped out at me as I've done research into just persuasion efforts is the number one thing that makes, uh, let's say, a, a we'll call like a swing voter, open to being persuaded about something. So like, if, let's just, I'll just take one example. So if 70% of Republicans think the election was stolen, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, well, what does that other 30% think? And the number one thing that makes somebody not, who's a Republican, not really think the election was stolen is that they have a mixed media diet. They watch Fox News, but they also watch CNN and they also watch their local news and they're taking in a bunch of different sort of things. And that allows them to kind of say, well, Fox News said it was stolen, but literally everybody else says it wasn't. They're like, I'm not sure. You know, there's somebody that they trust in their media diet um, and they're getting alternatives. Whereas for people who start with Fox News and then go further down the rabbit hole of Steve Bannon and social media and uh, whatever, Aaron Rodgers, I don't even know all these people, but they and they get trapped in there. They don't even hear the alternative ever. It's like a fait accompli. Of course, the election was stolen. What kind of idiot wouldn't think it was? I've heard a thousand people I trust talk about it. So my point being that the need to have sort of a bunch of different uh, outlets to help balance people out uh, is what people need. But instead, algorithmically, they just get drawn further and further into these other places by things like TikTok, but also other social media platforms. And, and there's always someone in control, I guess is my ultimate point. Like the idea that no one is, you are in control is like, no, man, they're taking all your data, they're hijacking your brain, and they're sending you like stuff that further radicalizes you. And so none of us are immune, I guess, to... Um, that question of like, it's all, it's all doing something to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you've alluded to it a couple of times, but I should probably say in my own voice too, that I am, I'm no dummy. And I also realize that <laughs> a lot of these problems we're discussing are internet problems. They're social media problems. They're not TikTok problems. They're, they're distribution problems. The kids are correct about a lot of that stuff. Um, there are the specific problems we've talked about with TikTok. And one of the, one of those specific problems that I wanted to, to kind of highlight on the, on the issue of trust that you just brought up, um, just when when people talk about like the, the idea that the app could kind of like disseminate essentially Chinese regime propaganda, I think a lot of people find that kind of silly on its face, like like that these kids are sitting there and they're seeing like videos of like some Chinese broadcaster in his weird suit at his weird desk with his like kind of glazed eyes, just kind of reading off the prompter, the the pro G stuff. Um, but but that, it, the app would, does not have to do that to, to accomplish that purpose because what what the genius of the the sorting mechanism is is you find the like three or five people who are already kind of saying similar things on there who are already like the viewer they're like random Americans sitting at home on their couch who happen to be like more CCP uh, you know favorable than than the median American and then they just get boosted you know I mean like that's and that's the and the the boosting mechanism is the thing that's so invisible when you're using the app because you don't see what other people are seeing you just scrolled to this because it was the next thing in your feed um, and so I think that's that's the the zeroing in on on that is why we are actually seeing this legislation now um, but it's it's kind of opaque to the average viewer so it's not surprising that it, it's hard for it to filter down to to the people who actually use TikTok right now. Well, yeah. And also, it's not that they need to make them trust the Chinese communist government, right? They just need to make Americans trust America's government, not at all, yes. right? It's like, yes. it's like this. And, and you know, there is sort of a healthy balance, I think, for freedom loving Americans in which you don't take everything our government says as gospel, but you need to have some faith that like the vaccine isn't going to like fill you with nanobots too. Um, At least it's better than China's, yeah. you know? <laughs> right. Like, Come on. And, and so I think that there's um, this idea of just like constantly making people increasingly skeptical, skeptical to the point of 
the government having no credibility with its own voters, which is obviously a real problem, and then makes it more susceptible to mm-hmm. propaganda from other countries um, who the are, government, are active enemies. The government and the media and all our tech companies and, you know, your local grocery store. I mean, it's it, it really is kind of amazing how pervasive some of this like anti-institutional i mean you talked we you played the clip of the the girl who had changed her whole diet i mean it, it's it's it, it really goes deep and and it, it does leave yeah it leaves it leaves people without kind of defenses to to compare you know the people who are maybe somewhat bad with the people who are really quite bad on a lot of this stuff and i think that's what we kind of saw throughout the group yeah, which leads me to sort of my last observation about the progressives and the conservatives, which is they sounded the same, basically, when it came to TikTok. Like, they uh, they were all distrustful. Like, they they were different. I mean, they were different uh, in terms of the issues that it elevated for them. But in terms of how much they liked TikTok and how much they disliked and distrusted the American man, that was like horseshoe theory all over the place. Uh, I don't know if that jumped out at you. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think that they were... I, I'm sure they were getting very different political diets on TikTok, uh-huh. um, but it would, but you know, and and kind of likely diets that kind of played to and flattered their own sensibilities in, in various ways. Again, like all of us do on social media all the time. Um, but yeah, the way that that kind of united them around the well, this is telling us kind of how it really is. The unvarnished truth was was very striking to me as well. Yeah. Okay. Last last point I want to talk about before we get out of here. Uh, can you just walk us through the intra MAGA infighting uh, on the TikTok front? So Kellyanne Conway is over in one corner with Trump donor Jeff Yass, uh, and Steve Bannon and Laura Loomer are in the other corner, and like Trump just like flipped on what he thought about this. Like, what is going on? Yes, yeah, so we, we we've spent all of this time uh, on on sort of how much of a shame it is that all of these kids don't trust institutions and are are total nihilists and all this stuff. And now here's a really good reason why you should completely be a nihilist because the <laughs> it's all about money. All of this infighting. Um, it's it Trump Trump had a lot of China hawks in his uh, term, perhaps his first term as president, um, and they kind of prevailed on him to to try to go after TikTok in this executive order. However, uh, since then, uh, TikTok has tied a lot of strings uh, 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 to Trump in, in kind of indirect ways, uh, not TikTok directly, but but um, Kellyanne Conway, uh, a close aide of his, is lobbying on TikTok's behalf on Capitol Hill, uh, not, sp- not directly on TikTok's behalf, but on behalf of the Club for Growth, a uh, conservative organization that gets a lot of uh, donations from this guy, Yass, uh, who it, who is a hedge funder who has a giant, giant, giant investment in, in TikTok, in ByteDance, in his hedge fund. Um, and Yass has met with Trump. And uh, Trump says they didn't talk about TikTok, but Trump says a lot of things. Um, oh, yeah. Speaking uh, of great arbiters of the truth. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, and just this morning, it was reported that, that Yass also owns a pretty large stake in the company that is trying to uh, uh, acquire Truth Social. Uh, to take it public, which would be a gigantic windfall for for Donald Trump personally, uh, and maybe even on on a scale that would get him out of the issues he's having financially, where he might have to sell a lot of his big beautiful buildings and things like that. So, I mean, there's there are there are remarkable like kind of direct, explicit financial connections on Trump. Uh, yes, as well, Jeff Yes has he donates to a lot of Republicans who who oppose the TikTok ban. Um, and and it's not to say that they're all necessarily on the dole. A lot of them are, you know, cranky libertarian types like Thomas Massey, who already had the predilection. Um, Trump is really the, the the one guy who very nakedly flipped on it. Um, so, so yeah, there's all sorts of weird kind of financial pressures. But then you mentioned like people like Steve Bannon and, and, and Laura Loomer, who uh, a lot of horrible things about them, but one of the bad things about them is not that they get uh, a lot of lobbying money from Republican uh, hedge funders because they don't. They're they're grassroots populist people who you know are crowdfunded basically. So they uh, they have been kind of clanging a bell, yelling at all the Republicans, not yet Trump, but all the other Republicans uh, who have have taken yes money, and it's all been very interesting and 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 kind of uh, a zoo to watch. Okay, well, nothing about this podcast made me more likely to download TikTok onto my phone. Uh, But, Andrew Egger, it did make me more likely to invite you back on the Focus Group podcast because it was excellent talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to all of you for listening to another episode of the Focus Group podcast. We will be back 
next week. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe, and we'll talk soon. Bye.